And Dr. Schrau, uh, the screen is all yours. Thank you for uh, participating in the CME and uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, okay, disclosures none. Uh, outline, this is what we need to do for CME. We're gonna do uh, background diagnosis treatment and um, the focus on the minimally invasive uh, options that our structural heart program is doing around the country. So valvular heart disease, it's um, obviously for any physician knows it's a, a defect in one of the four heart valves, the aortic, mitral, tricuspid, pulmonic. And nowadays we actually have percutaneous treatment in a minimally invasive way for all of those. Uh, so our programs between us and St. Joe's, uh, we treat mitral stenosis with, uh, depending on uh, something called the Wilkins score, either uh, balloon valvuloplasty or sometimes surgery. Uh, mitral regurgitation was traditionally surgical, but now with the mitral clip and then uh, new modalities coming out, uh, the, the percutaneous option is probably going to become the standard of care. Aortic stenosis, there's no question for all comers that uh, TAVR is, um, is the standard of care. Aortic regurgitation, that's uh, FDA off-label. However, uh, about 12% of the registry on the, uh, trans the uh, TVT uh, NCDR registry, which tracks all TAVRs, uh, tw about 12% are done for uh, aortic regurgitation, and that's for uh, compassionate care. Tricus uh, tricuspid stenosis, um, is also uh, something that we can deal with uh, percutaneously. Tricuspid regurgitation, that's kind of in its infancy. However, uh, new devices are coming out and one of my mentors was the first to do it in a human being and uh, at Cleveland Clinic. Um, pulmonary stenosis and pulmonary regurgitation, we have the Melody valve, which we, collaborate with the congenital um, and pediatric people. So what we're going to talk about today, we can't talk about all the valves. So we'll talk about uh, mostly MR and AS. So when we're working up these patients, this is the diagnostic studies. We put a star here on a detailed history and physical exam because in my opinion, that's the most important aspect of the diagnosis. So many of these patients, for example, aortic stenosis, uh, they, elderly patients tend to really downplay their symptoms. And when I talk to them more, I'll ask them questions like, well, what happens if you walk up a hill? And they're like, well, I can't do that. Uh, and then I, I tell them, uh, that basically aortic stenosis is like getting old. You look at yourself in the mirror every single day when you're getting ready, but you don't notice it because it's a gradual thing. But if you opened up your photo album from like 15 years ago, you'd see a drastic change. And, and that resonates with the, uh, with the patients. They get it that they can't do the same things that they did 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, standard uh, cardiac workup, ECG, echo, of course. Uh, treadmill stress test, that's only if we were uncertain um, if they were actually symptomatic or not, and if we wanted to bring out those symptoms. Cardiac cap, that's reserved for when we've already uh, decided that we're gonna do an intervention. So how often do we get these echocardiograms? Well, if you're in uh, the progressive category, which is that you have uh, mild to moderate asymptomatic 
disease, it, that would be for every three to five years uh, for either uh, AS or MR. When you have severe, which means you're symptomatic, um, it, or you're, if you're asymptomatic, you still have to follow it up every one year for AS. I would probably say six months, but this is the guidelines. And then uh, six to one years for MR. So how does MR get broken down? Well, there's two different ways that uh, people are getting mitral regurgitation. There's the degenerative pathway and then the uh, functional pathway. And they're kind of treated differently and that's why we separate those. Uh, but when the patients come to your office, they're gonna come with mostly, I would say, dyspnea on a exertion, but just not able to do the things that they can do before because they're tired and they're weak. Um, palpitations, most likely due to atrial fibrillation and right-sided heart failure, uh, which like edema, they'll come in uh, complaining of that, and, and then you'll find uh, JVD, ascites, and, and sometimes uh, liver dysfunction. So the prevalence of mitral disease, and that's why we're counting on this first, um, are, is, is much higher actually than aortic disease. Uh, and you can see by the time you get into uh, above the age of 65, it becomes quite prevalent. And then above the age of 75, uh, it's pretty much one-tenth of the population. Um, I think Olmstead County did a good job because of probably Mayo Clinic Rochester there took care of those people with the, with the uh, prevention plans. Uh, so how do people get MR? Uh, so myocardial infarction could cause an inferior wall or an anterior wall. Uh, infarction can cause uh, papillary muscle dysfunction. Um, if it causes pap rupture, usually that's fatal, but it can also cause dysfunction and that uh, could lead to MR. Uh, rheumatic heart disease is being much less seen in this country, uh, though I still see it quite often. Mitral valve prolapse, I keep a very close eye on with all of my younger patients um, with regular echoes. Endocarditis, um, we see it, but less often, but uh, more so senile degeneration and uh, annular dilatation, which that's where the, uh, the functional MR component comes in. The annulus will dilate with the uh, LV cavity and the, there will be non-coaptation of the, of the mitral valve leaflets. So uh, mitral regurgitation simply is that the mitral valve is not closing in a way that they're co-opting. It should be a one-way valve. Uh, so we'll talk about primary MR. Um, baseline for any PCP or cardiologist or uh, even OBGYN who's seeing someone with prolapse who's a young lady, uh, a, a transthoracic echo is a class one indication. Um, and if you don't get the information that you want from the uh, transthoracic echo, a cardiac MRR, uh, MRI is a, a very good modality. Uh, it shows LV function, RV function, but it's really good at showing valve function as well. So that's something that we offer at Chandler Regional and, and we have one of the best who does it for me. So indications for mitral valve surgery, it's symptomatic patients, however, 
um, their EF has to be over 30%. That, that's not like a stat and fast rule, but when the EF is below 30%, sometimes the MR is used as a pop-off uh, to relieve the pressure uh, for the left ventricle. So if you close it, then the left ventricle acutely declines. So you have to be really careful if you're going to be doing it under 30% if you're going to fix the mitral. Uh, of course, that's a class one. And then in asymptomatic patients, it's uh, we have LV dysfunction, which is less than 60%. Uh, or a uh, LV uh, systolic diameter of, of uh, 40, of over 40. Now, 60% is a normal LVEF. However, if you had severe MR and 50% of your cardiac output is going in the wrong direction, um, it means that really your cardiac output is half of that. So that's why the cutoff is so high and that makes sense. And then pulmonary hypertension as well. Atrial fibrillation is a class 2A. Um, MR causes uh, dilatation of the left atrium, and uh, therefore uh, that predisposes patients to atrial fibrillation. Um, and fixing Instead of treating the atrial fibrillation, perhaps fixing the problem that's causing the atrial fibrillation or the bad player. Uh, so in terms of uh, repair versus replacement, it's uh, significantly better to have a, a high volume surgeon in my case, I anytime I choose a surgeon, I look to see what their volumes of repair versus replacement, and I base it on that because repair uh, the patients fare way better, and uh, and I prefer that. And I, even though it's technically more challenging, but luckily at uh, St. Joe's and Chandler Regional. We have an expert who does pretty much almost everything is repair, uh, like even with complicated cases. So surgery, like I said, it's kind of tricky but it uh, can be considered in patients with a low ejection fraction of lower than uh, 30%. Um, however, we have to sit down with the cardiologist and the surgeon and really think about it before we do that, and that's a class 2B. So that's where uh, the percutaneous options come in. So. What we do uh, percutaneously, we go through the, the vein and then we, the ephemeral vein, and then we go transeptal. And then from above, we uh, use the uh, mitra clip and that uh, cinches the valve and then kind of creates a double valve, uh, which significantly uh, improves the. MR. So a surgical valve would probably have, as long as the surgeon is competent, would have a 0% uh, MR. But this could take you from 4 plus to 1 plus MR. And then I've even seen trace MR. And sometimes we have to put in uh, 2 or 3 uh, to achieve that. The benefit of this is we could, before deploying it, we could see how the left ventricle responds um, in patients that are prohibitive for surgery, probably because their ejection fraction is low, um, and make sure they tolerate it. 
And then also with echocardiography, we could see that they don't have, uh, we're not creating significant uh, mitral stenosis. So this has uh, been FDA approved. It's a uh, class B, but uh, it's a very effective uh, device. And uh, it's something that we have available uh, in the Dignity system. And we're pretty, actually we're excellent at uh, uh, those procedures. So secondary MR, so that's functional MR. Again, echo, non-invasive imaging that uh, any standard primary care or cardiologist will do, all class one. Uh, management, uh, goal-directed medical therapy for heart failure. Um, and CRT is actually helpful um, due to LV uh, dyssynchrony, MR can sometimes get worse, and there's a lot of data that shows that by resynchronization, uh, resynchronization therapy, it gets better. So that's a, called a BIV ICD. Um, and I'm sure a lot of your patients have it. Uh, so the indications for the mitral valve surgery. Um, we would think about them, that's a class 2A if they have severe MR, but they're going either for a double valve or a bypass, uh, severe MR with uh, persistent heart failure. And that's after we tried all of our options with medications and uh, a by the ICD. Uh, so uh, patients with moderate ischemic MR, um, either we'll revascularize them with stents, but if they're undergoing cabbage or an AVR, then uh, they, they should have their moderate disease fix. So uh, the, I want to talk about the mitra clip a little bit more. It's, it's for um, Secondary MR, it's not primarily, but there's a new trial that uh, showed that it was very effective. Uh, again, for prohibitive uh, surgical risk. And here's a little bit of data on that. So it first gained approval in 2013. I remember because I was working with one guy on the trial. Um, at uh, Lenox Hill Hospital in New York, who got the text and he was so excited. But that was for uh, just, that wasn't for an annular size that was uh, greater than uh, seven. So there's a lot of patients that were not getting it. And then there was the COAP trial. So the COAP trial is patients who have functional MR. And that was a very robust uh, trial, and it, it's patients with dilated cardiomyopathy and heart failure whose annulus would actually dilate, and they wanted to see if a mitra clip would help them, and they, it, it significantly did because the reduction in hospitalization was nearly 50%, and the risk of death uh, within two years was... Uh, reduced by nearly 40%. Um, as a result of that, uh, we started using this for the functional MR as well. And you could see the contraindications, but that's something that the cardiologist will deal with. So aortic stenosis, um, not as prevalent as mitral regurgitation, but uh, but also very prevalent, especially in our community here in Arizona with all of our elderly patients. So by definition, it's a narrowing of the aortic valve. I tell my patients that your valve should be the size of a garden hose. And by the time they see me, it's the size of a pencil. Um, therefore, it's physiologically impossible for them not to feel crappy. 
to, to put it in and like, excuse my French. But uh, so they ration the blood. If they're walking, it goes to the muscles at the expense of their brain. Uh, therefore, they get lightheaded at the expense of their heart. Therefore, they might get chest pain at the expense of the lungs. Therefore, they might get uh, short of breath. So um, this is what I tell them. And they always say one of those uh, three things. Um, also causes, if you wait too long, left ventricular hypertrophy, which is uh, cardiac remodeling. And we hope that after we fix the valve that we'll have reverse remodeling. Um, but uh, it doesn't always happen. Sometimes you get uh, a little too far. So the etiology uh, in young uh, people, we look for congenital stuff. So it's either bicuspid and it's more so bicuspid and sometimes rheumatic heart disease. Uh, Middle-aged to elderly, it's uh, senile degenerate uh, degeneration of the valve can be rheumatic heart disease which i mean i have a patient i'm working up right now i wouldn't consider him elderly 72 but he certainly looks like he has rheumatic disease uh, or um, it could be bicuspid if it's middle age um, but what i do tell my uh, elderly patients is that I, I take their heart rate and if it's 80, uh, I, I do the math and I do it on my phone and I show them and I ask them, how many times do you think your heart opens and close, uh, your heart valve opens and closes per day? And if it's 80 and you do the math, it's uh, 115,000 times per day. So I told them, with anything, uh, just like your joints that you use every day, um, you're going to build calcium. Well, you're going to be build calcification, and you're going to build calcium, which could cause arthritis in your knee. But it's also going to cause calcium of your valves, uh, and they get it. So the clinical manifestations are again fatigue, exertional dyspnea chest pain and syncope for all the reasons that I, uh, I described before. It's a fixed cardiac output. Therefore, the body physiologically has to ration the cardiac output. Uh, so if you want to walk around and that blood's going to your legs and not to your brain, then you will pass out and or you can have any of these other manifestations. So this is what I call the cliff. Um, so people cruise along with aortic stenosis. They have a latent period where they don't have symptoms and they can go on and on and on. But as soon as they have symptoms and, and on the right side, this is a, a famous, uh, this is from uh, Braunwald. And it's a, it's a famous picture showing the life expectancy uh, when you get here. Um, so the, the cliff you can see, as soon as you have severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, if it's not treated, you just fall right off of the cliff and your life expectancy is, is incredibly poor. Um, the five year, life expectancy is uh, actually better for metastatic lung cancer than it is for untreated severe aortic stenosis, and, uh, which is sad because we could just fix it. Um, so th this is a, a slide that uh, we look at in order to kind of work up our patients. Uh, low risk, intermediate risk, high risk. We use STS uh, score. Uh, we use frailty. And then we look at other uh, organ systems. Uh, and this is part of the workup. This is very standard. Uh, and it's part of our registry. So 
One thing that we do and we do very well is that we have a multidisciplinary hard valve team. So there's uh, me, I'm the director. Um, there's uh, Dr. Kevin Brady and Dr. Ashton are from cardiothoracic surgery. Um, Dr. Vijay Krishna, who's a uh, advanced heart failure specialist. We have cardiac anesthesia and nursing. Uh, this is something that uh, has really, in my opinion, uh, added to the success of what we've done uh, in our program. And, uh, and every program should take it very seriously. And then uh, consultation with the uh, heart valve, uh, COE also. So there's different stages. There's asymptomatic severe AS, um, and that's being looked at uh, in a new trial uh, because I kind of don't believe that uh, that there's such a thing as asymptomatic severe AS. Um, and then we see the others. Um, and then symptomatic severe high grade uh, AS is, is that needs to be fixed because they're going to fall off the cliff. And then there's a phenomenon called low flow, low gradient AS. And uh, it could be two ways. It, it could be with a low EF. And in that case, it just means that the cardiac output is not enough in order to create a gradient. Um, and therefore, we sometimes do a dobutamine echo to, to uh, really establish whether, first, if they have viability, because there's something called burnout AS. If you wait too long, that no matter what you do, the EF will not recover. or if the left ventricle will augment and then create that uh, that gradient across the uh, valve that uh, you need in order to get your FDA approval for uh, a TAVR. Um, secondly, the the um, low flow, low gradient AS. Uh, what we do is we do echoes and we look at uh, at the um, the index of the cardiac output, uh, and that's uh, done through echocardiogram. If, if it's under uh, 35 per uh, body surface area, then that should be looked at more by the heart team. And here's more uh, echo and dobutamine stress tests, like we said. So uh, what are the indications for valve replacement? If it's symptomatic, no brainer, severe with a high grade, uh, high gradient, um, low flow, low gradient, as we discussed before. And uh, so we've kind of touched upon these things before. So asymptomatic patients, if you have severe AS with the LVEF under 50, then that's a class one. Um, or if they're gonna go for a bypass or something else, uh, also a class one. And uh, if they're deemed low surgical risk, uh, that's a, a two A. Uh, however, these things are, are, are changing um, as we're doing more trials with TAVR. Uh, and moderate AS undergoing another cardiac surgery. For example, if you had moderate aortic stenosis and you're having a bypass and they're already in there, they could replace that. Uh, and we're working on the, the trial for moderate AS just in general. Um, like uh, Susan had mentioned, I'm a principal investigator for TAVR and load, and that, that's the goal to see, just to answer the question, 
that why wait until it's severe? Uh, should we just fix it and when, like before it gets severe and it causes problems? And you can see like rapid progression as well. So this is what I do. Uh, this is called TAVR, um, trans, uh, cat, it should say trans catheter, uh, valve replacement. Um, although we do trans aortic sometimes. Uh, so there's two FDA approved products, although there's many others that are available. Um, and there's trials for many of them, but right now, the available ones are uh, the Edwards company, which the latest one is, uh, this is the Sapien S3. However, they came up with, uh, this one actually looks like the fourth generation, which is a uh, Sapien S3 Ultra. Uh, so that's what, I wouldn't call it a fourth generation, but it is, uh, an improvement of the S3, um, and it's just an excellent system. It makes us look very good, but the the uh, equipment does all the work for you. So you just sit back and and let people applaud you. Uh, this is the so that's balloon expandable, and then the self expandable is the Medtronic platform. So they have the um, Evolute Pro now is the, the one that is the third generation. And, I, and I've worked through every single one of these generations and they just exponentially get better and better. So this has a, a super annular um, uh, valve. So it's each of them, I would say probably 90% of the time can be interchangeable, but 10% of the time one is better than the other. And this is how we choose um, basically TAVR versus SAVR and SAVR standing for surgical AVR. Um, and this has kind of changed a little bit because over here, uh, there's multiple uh, trials that we're going to show that show that TAVR is actually beneficial. And I'm going to show you those numbers. They're incredibly impressive. And they were really the talk of the American College of Cardiology at their main meeting. But uh, for obviously for every, so essentially for like all comers, uh, TAVR is an option. It doesn't mean that I never send for SAVR. Um, if I have a very, very young person uh, that I, I think uh, that TAVR doesn't have the data on the durability because these valves are so new, even though the first one was done in 2001, the uh, fourth generations were just released in uh, 2015, so we have to see. But there's there's no evidence to think that they would be inferior in terms of durability. And if that was the case, we would just do a valve and valve caver. So surgical AVR is pretty much not going to be done very much. So here's the uh, two trials. So first is the Medtronic trial, which is the Evolute Lowris trial, which would be like if I needed a aortic valve and I don't have any medical problems, I could opt for TAVR. So it this was non in, a non-inferiority study um, for uh, mortality or MACE outcomes like major uh, adverse cardiac events um, by MACE. Um, but statistically, it, it was non-inferior, but it, there was a trend towards inferior. Um, 
Then we have the Sapien 3 trial, which had a, it was supposed to be non inferiority trial, but it actually showed superiority, significant superiority, uh, 15.1 versus 8.5 in terms of adverse events of 12 months. However, that trial is somewhat skewed. You cannot uh, compare the two trials, uh, the apples and oranges, because um, this had MACE events, but it also included rehospitalization when the Medtronic trial did not uh, include that. So you, both of them showed that TAVR is better, or at least uh, uh, the same, but uh, you know, you can't compare the Edwards valve to the Medtronic valve. And those are the curves for you. And this was the outcome, and this is in line with our program as well. Actually, our program does better. So who should go to Taver? Susan, she's low risk, 73-year-old female, have some heart failure. STS2, Taver. David, 81, uh, NYHA3, surgical risk 6, he's intermediate, Taver. Patricia, 88, heart failure, frail, STS of 10, so 10% chance of dying in uh, surgery, Taver. So the whole point of this is that pretty much everyone is TAVR. Uh, and this goes through everything that we said that basically the only per uh, basically everyone goes for TAVR in aortic stenosis. Um, but for surgical AVR, if it was a combined thing where they're doing either a double valve, a, uh, they're fixing the aorta, or they're doing cabbage. Um, aortic regurgitation, however, like I said, 12% we're doing off-label uh, uh, with uh, compassionate care if the, if the patient is not a surgical candidate. Of course, endocarditis because they have to clean it out. And, and we consider it in young patients in very young patients, but that threshold is changing. Um, low cor coronary height and uh, a sh like small sinus of Valsalva, um, that has a risk of uh, closing off the arteries, but um, I'm not really worried about that at all because I, I usually protect the arteries uh, if I'm concerned at all before I even deploy the valve. So, you know, that's, that's not really a big deal. But uh, TAVR, besides the things that we mentioned here, I'd say that uh, it's pretty much the gold standard. And how do we do it? How do we do all this stuff? Well, we can't do it on our own. We do a multidisciplinary heart team approach. And um, I mentioned a few of the people uh, but uh, I need to mention my coordinators, Linda Baker and uh, Peggy Banya, who, I mean, honestly, they, uh, they are my bosses. They just tell me what to do and they run the program and then they just gave me the title of director. So they are the heart and soul. And then also collaboration. So we have uh, Dr. Bond and we have multiple um, collaborations with research projects um, and also just uh, clinical cardiac care. And it's been very fruitful on both sides. Um, our side's providing the procedures, her side's providing the care and also uh, just like the education and, and the volume. So this is, it's a comprehensive team. Um, 
And that is, is the key to having the numbers that we have 